Hello, it's John Wilding from the University of Liverpool with uh, Philip Burgess, who's my colleague in ophthalmology, uh, talking now about the pathogenesis of uh, retinopathy and diabetes. Now, Philip, um, I think we all accept that high blood glucose is the primary cause of retinopathy and diabetes, and we've got some quite good data from clinical trials like the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial in UKPDS that show that in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes that lowering blood glucose reduces the risk of retinopathy. However, there's also, I think, some data that suggests that other risk factors may contribute to the pathogenesis of retinopathy, particularly I'm thinking about lipids, maybe systemic inflammation, blood pressure. What's your take on that and how do you think we should think about that in terms of the causes of retinopathy and maybe in the future about its treatment? Absolutely. So we, we see risk factors as non-modifiable and modifiable. So the, the number one non-modifiable risk factor for retinopathy is duration of disease and that, that's a, a hugely important factor. Um, in terms of modifiable, yes, as you say, we have good randomised interventional randomised control evidence that reduction in HbA1c, uh, reduction in glucose, reduces uh, microvascular complications in uh, in diabetes, including retinopathy. And the figure I always remember from the uh, UK PDS is a reduction in. 1% to HbA1c, roughly equivalent to uh, 10 millimoles in new measurement of uh, HbA1c. Uh, and with that, you get a 25% reduction in microvascular complications. And a majority of those microvascular events in the UK PDS were, was, was retinopathy mm. endpoints. Um, in terms of other factors, we also have good interventional randomized control t data that uh, reduction in blood pressure is uh, reduces your risk of retinopathy. So reduction in progression to treatment and to laser treatment, reduction in progression to visual loss. So uh, definitive evidence on that. In, in terms of lipids, the story is a bit more complicated. Uh, the exactly which lipid parameter is important in retinopathy has, has uh, n never been fully defined. We do have some interesting data from the field study which showed a reduction in retinopathy progression with oral phenofibrate. However, the reductions weren't correlated with lipid levels in those patients. So we're unsure of the, the mechanism really in that. So, so the lipid story in, in diabetic retinopathy appears to be a complex, a complex one that has yet to be fully elucidated. Uh, there are of course other risk factors, some of which are um, less well understood. We're unsure of the role of anemia, we're unsure of uh, the role of in inflammatory disease. We, we used to think about retinopathy as a disease of, of blood vessels, mm. of, the, of the microvasculature at the back of the eye. We now have a more complete understanding of the disease which sees it really as a microangiopathy, a uh, neuropathy, and um, an inflammatory disease. Mm -hmm. And the, the hope is that we'll ha in the future we'll have uh, agents which target the, those different pathways in the disease. Um, but at the moment, as, as you've said, the, the primary aims that we have are controlling blood sugar uh, and controlling blood pressure as a means to uh, reduce pr progression of retinopathy. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. But just as, as an aside, another area which is actually an interest of mine is, is actually, um, and you may be aware of this, that people with sleep apnea, which is very common in diabetes, also seem to get more rapid progression of retinopathy. And of course, sleep apnea is associated with hypertension, so that's one possible reason. But it's also associated with intermittent hypoxia. So what's the role of hypoxia in, 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 in retinopathy? And it, it, could that be the explanation for the sleep apnea? Absolutely. The, the, all those mechanisms have, have been proposed. With, there's, de, there's definite evidence that, that sleep apnea is associated with increased progression of retinopathy, but, but, the, but the mechanism is uncertain. As you said, hypertension, hypoxia have been, been, been proposed, uh, but, but we just don't know what the definitive answer is on, on that. So one of the other areas that, that's raised some very recent concerns, in fact, in one of, our, one of the trials uh, of uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, which was the SUSTAIN-6 trial with semaglutide, but I think this actually uncovered uh, an old story, is that if you improve glucose control very rapidly in people who start off with poor control, and particularly if they already have some retinopathy, you can actually make the retinopathy worse. And that's a bit of a paradox, but it also creates a problem for me as a diabetes specialist in what do I do when somebody's got poor control? I want to get them better. 
and yet you come along and tell me, don't get the better too quickly. So how do I deal with that? Uh, absolutely. So the, uh, the overall picture, the big picture, is that we know that reduction in uh, HbA1c is associated with uh, reduced progression of retinopathy and overall be better outcomes. So that, that, that we, we have to be clear on that. But you're right that there is some evidence that in a minority of patients, rapid reduction in, uh, in HbA1c over a relatively short uh, time period, so we're talking um, around over a period of about six months and a reduction in probably about 1.52% HbA1c equivalent to about um, 20, 25 uh, millimoles uh, reduction over over six months. Uh, in some patients, and you're right, it, it, it's generally thought to be patients with pre-existing retinopathy, that there appears to be what's termed an early worsening of retinopathy. It, it's a well-described phenomenon. It's been associated with uh, levels of insulin-like growth factors, um, but we but there's still a lot of unanswered questions about that phenomenon. We don't know we don't know the, the mechanism. We also don't know the thresholds at which um, the, 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 the figure that's, that's given is that people think that the, the level of retinopathy at which you're at risk of this is about 35 on the EDTRS scale. So that's uh, just above background retinopathy. So, um, so we think that you have to have a, a threshold level of retinopathy before you're at risk of this. And we think there's, there's thresholds and the numbers I've, I've mentioned over a rapid reduction in glucose control over a relatively short amount of time. But uh, we're doing research at the moment in Liverpool on exactly who, who those patients are at risk uh, and how we can better define the population at risk. And then we have to have um, better uh, strategies to, to uh, mitigate that risk. Um, the first of those is that um, we we aim to reduce glycemic control at a slightly slower rate, uh, and that would be a, a message for di diabetologists. For the if we, for the patients at risk, we can uh, bring down the HbA1c at a slower rate. We definitely want to bring down the HbA1c, but but not rapidly. And then the second. Um, challenge for us is to monitor those patients more closely. So in Liverpool we have local um, protocols that um, that patients are, are monitored more closely within the ho hospital eye service at their, if they're at risk of, of that complication. Mm. So um, it, it's not that we don't reduce HbA1c, it's we reduce it, but uh, well, our diabetologist colleagues uh, aim to reduce that and then if retinopathy does worsen we can instigate treatment more quickly. Okay, thanks very much. So as, uh, in practical terms, you, you, what you're saying to me is don't try and reduce HbA1c by more than about 10 millimoles per mole in, in six months, and particularly at the in, in patients who have significant retinopathy. And in those patients, we should certainly be having a conversation with you about ensuring that those patients get their eyes looked at more regularly uh, during that period of time. Absolutely, yes. Those those are the numbers that, uh, that are given. There's, there's the the evidence is not definitive yet, and we're we're working to produce that evidence. Mm. But absolutely, those those are the those are the kind of figures that we have in our heads. Okay, that's really helpful. So the key messages for us are good glucose control, good blood pressure control, good lipid control may benefit, but we're not quite sure about why or how. Yeah. Um, and if they've got sleep apnea, we probably should be aware that they're at higher risk, um, and not to improve HbA1c too quickly if the control is poor. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much.